So, since there was, since there was a, an increase in debt, then people start saying, well, then what do we have to do? Let's just stop giving methanol. So that's what people in Wales thought in 1997 and, and between 1997 and 2003. And what they did then is they say, okay, if this is the problem, then let's just stop giving uh, methanol to people. And what we have here, these are um, a standardized mortality uh, rate per year, and the yellow dot is methadone males uh, using methadone. This is uh, heroin, so you see the two of them are going up. And females, for some reason, they are always better than men. Look, methadone, they didn't do that bad. And then if you look at the heroin, it wasn't that bad either, right? Mm -hmm. So then they said, well, it, let's get rid at least of the methadone problem. So what they did is they took the methadone clinics, basically. And as a result, what they saw is that, yes, of course, there was less methadone out there, so less death related to methadone, but there was a spike here of deaths related to heroin. So what they did here, when they were right here, which is the year 2000, they, scare, they, they were scared um, um, uh, to death, and then, then they decided to put the methadone back in the system, and look how the death started to come back down again. So bottom line is that you are going to make a recommendation like stop methadone. You've got to make sure that you are not hurting people, because in this particular case, obviously, for people that need the methadone in an MNTP clinic, it has an impact. So you can't say, like what people are telling me, well, just forget about this, let's just stop the methadone, or the other people that say, you know, continue the methadone. So people are becoming very irrational. So it's a nice field to ask questions, because we don't have answers yet. The question is what type of, what type of questions you're going to ask. And so one thing that I think that it is relevant is the prolongation of the, of the <coughs> QT interval, right? If you divide this by the... Uh, heart rate, then you get the QTC, which is corrected. And it goes from the beginning of the QRX complex, which is the bit of the ventricles, uh, to the repolarization here, right? And this is very, very, very critical. It's a very important information because if that gets prolonged, then you can get into trouble. So the reality, though, is that if you look at the literature, people that start looking at this problem, goes back to 1973, and you can see the data from Stimmel and co-workers. I, I, I got a chance to, to meet Dr. Stimmel, who now is an old man, um, last year at a meeting, and it was great. He was presenting the old data, he was presenting some new data, and the discussion was, was really very rich, and to me very rewarding. But the, the interesting stuff is that they were looking, they were suspecting that something was going on. And for that reason, what they did is they looked at... Uh, at patients back then, and they looked the, and, and found that the QT interval was prolonged in about 34 patients of all the, all the patients that were looking into. But they didn't see, uh, towards the point, they didn't see any other toxicity. They were not very worried. And what happened is that this data uh, became forgotten until the year 2000, where they were resuscitated with more energy based on more data or new evidence. So. Some people are saying, why are we talking about then about the danger of methadone on the QTC and cardiac toxicity? If we've known this since 1973, <laughs> everybody would be dead by now. What's going on? So how come people didn't see it before? Why was it an issue before? And one potential answer to that question is that this is 1973. So methadone was introduced as substitution therapy in the 60s. So this is very early into the substitution therapy era. Um, back in those days, the dose of methadone that people were using was 40 milligrams, 60 milligrams. The data on decreased mortality and morbidity with higher doses of methadone are from the late 80s, the 90s, right? When people started to go up to 100 milligrams or 120, 140 milligrams in the, in the, in the methadone clinics that before was unheard of. So perhaps at that point, the situation wasn't as bad because the doses were lower than the doses that we use now. And now that we are using it for uh, uh, management of pain, so 120, you know, is a piece of cake. Come on, guys. We use, what, 300, 400, 500 milligrams. So it's, it's a completely different animal. So the issues that we didn't detect back in 1973 might be now more relevant and more easy to detect. And this is what actually is going on. So this is a real <coughs> recording. So what you see here is, a, is an action potential. This is the way it looks in real life. 
and you measure from here to here, right? And then if you, if what you do, if uh, you have toxicity on the heart and you have uh, an arrhythmia that is produced by the prolongation of the QTC interval, this is what you see, and this is called torsade de point, where did you get up here to this side. And this is, is an arrhythmia, it means that the, 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 the uh, heart is contracted in a way that is very anarchic, is not efficient, and most patients that get to that point, they die. So it's a very serious arrhythmia. So why do we get to that point? Well, this is what we are seeing at the surface level. That means if you put electrodes on the chest, you are going to record that, that's an EKG. Now, what is the correlate when you look at the fiber, at the muscle fiber, in the tissue itself? So if you get a muscle fiber and you put it in a Petri dish and you get an electrode in it, you can record an action potential. And this is an action potential. So what you have here, this is about minus 70 millivolts. This starts depolarizing slowly uh, and reaches the threshold. And then you have an automatic firing of an action potential. This is a sodium current. This is calcium. And this is a potassium current. So this potassium current is very important. If you consider... Uh, what is the distribution of potassium across the membrane? Then outside the membrane, if you do an SMA20, right, and you take blood from a patient, what are you going to find? What is the potassium? About 4, right? 4, 4.5. Now, if you compare with the inside, the inside is what? 140, 145. So it's a huge gradient there. So when you open up these potassium channels that are voltage sensitive, and they are open because they reach this voltage up here, then the potassium that is inside the cell is going to rush out. It's going to go out. By going out, you lose positive charges. So this is, is very positive here. You lose positive charges, and it starts going down, down, down to the baseline, right? So the problem is that some drugs, including methadone, may block this delay uh, rectifying current. So the potassium has difficulties to leave the cell. So you accumulate positive charges inside the cell, and then the action potential gets prolonged. And this predisposes, this prolongation predisposes to this anarchic type of EKG, which, as I said before, it can be fatal. So this is another way, actually, to look at the evidence that we have, and, actually, and, and it helps us to, to, to wonder what was going on that people wasn't, wasn't seeing this. Look at this. This is the FDA spontaneous reporting system for QTC and TDP for any, for any drug. So this is related to methadone, particularly. We picked the data on, on methadone. And then you can see the number of reports uh, in, in the different years. 1996, how many reports? One report. Then this is 1987, one report. Then 1998, one report. Then in the year 2000, suddenly we have a bunch of reports here. Look. Then in the year 2001, is, is also about the same that in, in, 2000, in 2000, and then, and then the following year is, is, just, is just way much higher. So what happens? So people start dying or having more QTCs? Well, I think that the interpretation of this <coughs> is that in the year 2000, there was a critical p a paper by Kranz and co-workers, and what they did is they look at the data in the... What they did is they look at the data... Uh, of patients that they have in the uh, critical care unit, and they found that some patients on methadone, they were dying by going into torsade point. The problem is that that was an observational study. Many patients have abnormalities in the potassium, in calcium, in magnesium, so that might have contributed to that. But nonetheless, it was an eye-opener. People were not looking at that before. So in the year 2000, people became very, very aware, very worried, started looking into it. And when you start looking at something and, and trying to, to, to see, then you find it. And that's when people start finding it and start reporting it. So to me, that was fascinating. So this is to continue with the story now with Chuck, with, when Chuck asked me for that slide. So that weekend, I said, well, you know, piece of cake. I just do it just go to Google you know, and PubMed, and that's the end of the story. So by the night of that holiday, after 12 hours working nonstop, I had no idea what the heck was going on in the literature. And the reason is because if you look at the recommendations for EKG to, in, in patients taking methadone, so what is the recommendation? What do you do? 
and I did this in the year 2008. Well, some people tell you, you have to be vigilant for doses um, above 600 milligrams a day. What does it mean, be vigilant? That you go home and you don't sleep that night? What does it mean? And 600 milligrams. Why 600 milligrams? Where does that come from? From nowhere. Patients on high doses, those need an EKG. What does it mean, a high dose? How do you define it, a high dose? So there is no definition of high, of high dose. Never necessary. So they go from this extreme, which is interesting, to, uh, to do it on everybody. Consider EKG in patients on high doses only, high doses before starting, QTC prolongation, other medications that can prolong the QTC, EKG screening in patients uh, at risk, especially after... So, so it, it is really all over the place. So the two extremes are that it's never necessary or that you consider EKG on everybody before starting methadone. So how can you make recommendations based on this level of evidence? It's just very complicated.